uh, let me begin by inviting all of us to give a big warm applause for all the speakers uh, today, not just for this session, but also the previous session. And by the way, uh, Fabima, you were excellent as, you, as a moderator, but I want to tell you and all of you that this 15-minute rule doesn't work on me. <laughs> because when you are the producer of the conference, you can do anything you want. <laughs> Good. And by the way, you know, I was out there walking and having uh, my tea and lunch, and I had so many of you come to me and calling me, you know, His Excellency, Your Excellency, here, wait, can I do this? Whatever. Look, I'm a very humble person. Don't call me His Excellency or Your Excellency. Just call me Excellency. <laughs> Don't, don't use the his or the your. Excellency is fine. And I find it quite remarkable that, you know, first, I think after session two, usually you get half the crowd. You know, this is a thousand people group, right? So usually when seminars like this, you know, usually 200 stay, but I find it quite amazing that this room remains filled even until the end of the session, which says that we have great interest in this. And you know, my theory is that you stayed only because Nicholas Saputra was around. And I had told Masagus uh, that after Nicholas Saputra leaves, which he left, I think, uh, that you all, or half of you would be gone. So I'm, I'm quite flattered that you remain here. Until Padima remind me, actually they're staying because they want the gadgets at the end, the prize, right? Do they have a gadget prize in the end after this? Yes, yeah, so, but I'll try to fool myself by believing you actually want to hear what we have to say. Uh, but, you know, there's a reason why uh, I organized this Futurology Conference. Uh, this is the second Futurology Conference. The first one was last year. And the reason was, when I went to universities and things like that, uh, sometimes I talk to students and sometimes even opinion makers, and sometimes I get the feeling that we have too much nostalgic about the past. You know, there's some kind of baggage that we have. And, and I think if we really want to reclaim our greatness, you know, by Gita talk about it this morning, by Cairo, but what Indonesia can be in the 21st century, you gotta let go a lot of our historical baggages. You know, you gotta look forward, and this is why futurology is strategic. Uh, my ambition is to make futurology a hip thing to study in universities and in the think tanks of Indonesia. Because sometimes I think we just too much preoccupied with things in Indonesia or things in the region and things in the present, right? Because democracy really great thing, but democracy sometimes has the effect of forcing us to be short-term, yeah, uh, just until the next elections. And what we need is for Indonesia, for all our generation to think for the long term. This is the strategic reason why uh, we uh, came up with this international conference on futurology and we want to make this an annual uh, thing. All right. Now, the theme of this futurology is revolutions. Right? revolutions and for Indonesians when we use the word revolutions something steers inside of you you think about 1945 our great revolutions and that revolution would always be important to us yeah because that revolution formed our nationalism it formed what we're all about but what I want to tell you is that there's a different kind of revolution that goes on now yeah we call it 21st century revolutions. And this is why the theme revolutions is so prominent in our conference today. Is this working? Next slide. Can I get some help? Not working? Next slide. Sorry? What? 
Okay, good. All right, I'm a, I'm a Catholic on this. But what's the difference between 20th century revolutions and 21st century revolutions? Right? Uh, 20th century revolutions tend to be violent. The 21st re century revolutions tend to be silent. 21st, 20th century revolutions were about freedom. 21st century revolutions created an enormous wealth of middle class. 20th century revolutions were always or often followed by coup d'etat, whereas 21st century revolutions created a lot of civil societies that we see in Indonesia. 20th century revolutions created a lot of sovereignty, sovereign nations. 21st century revolutions created connectivity. 20th century created equality. 21st century revolutions created connectivity. 20th century revolutions created liberation of people, of nations. 21st century ones created transformation and elevation. 20th century revolutions created uneasy bipolarity in the Cold War. 21st century revolutions created, created peace among the major powers. 20th century revolutions created developing nations, hundreds of them, populating the world. 21st century revolutions created something new, which is called emerging powers. Now, the 21st century revolution is remarkable because it has no expiry date. You know, President Sukarno once said, he was asked, what is a revolution? He said, a revolution is something that never stops, you know. He said he was something that keeps going on and on and on forever, he says. And then, for some reasons, we lost meaning of what President Sukarno said. But now, I think we are recapturing it. Because the 21st century revolutions, it's not just political revolutions, it's more civilizational. You know, it's more wide. It's economic, social, cultural, and other things. And it has no expiry date, and it's less obvious, because you don't really feel it. Right? We just experience it, and it happens. And what is unique about this 21st century revolutions is that there are no giant figures. You know, 20th century revolutions, you have Sukarno, you have uh, Nkrumah, you have Gandhi, you have Nehru, you have Nasser, right? But in the 21st century revolutions, you have Muhammad Bouazizi, uh, Tukang Sayur, yeah, Tukang Bawabohan di Tunisia, whose death created the Tunisian revolution. Uh, you have Wael Gonim, some guy who used the Google uh, methods uh, to spark the, uh, what do you call it, the, the, the public, uh, apa namanya, uh, a movement that bring that brought down the government in uh, Egypt. And then you have Muhammad Yunus, you know, a banker from uh, Bangladesh who won the uh, Nobel Peace Prize by changing the way governments and banks deal with poverty. And one of my favorite examples is Buted Manur in Indonesia uh, who uh, uh, went to Indonesia's jungles uh, and transformed the way Orang Subhanak Dalam uh, live, okay? So the 21st century revolutions, in my view, are more powerful, more powerful than 20th century revolutions. It's less romantic, but more powerful. Uh, what we see now, for example, more than half of the world population have been classified as middle class. Not worthy, but have been. And this will continue to grow. Uh, there have been hundreds of millions of people lifted out of poverty. I think we are nearing, by the end of the century, near zero poverty. That has always been the dream of mankind, and only in the 21st century we can hopefully achieve that. More than half the world population is now urbanized, and the number of electoral democracies in the world now is 117 countries. In 1990, that number was only 76, and in 74, that number was only 40, which means now the spread of freedom throughout the world is enormous and has never been before seen in history. So with these powerful revolutions that are unseen, unfelt sometimes, not so obvious, but so powerful, not just in Indonesia, but all over the place, the question is how do you survive them, right? How do you thrive in these revolutions? Now, Bima Arya said, I'm gonna give you five things, five survival tips. But I'm going to give you only four because you didn't pay to get into this conference. This is free, so I'm giving you four. If you pay next time, I'll give you five. 